I may or may not have told you, but uh, this past Saturday we had our open house here. So I got here at quarter to seven and I stayed for about six and a half hours. So bottom line is I was pretty damn tired over the weekend. And then my daughter came over and dropped her daughter off yesterday and left with my wife for the day. So I haven't graded anything. No excuse. I'm just letting you know why I didn't grade anything. So I'm going to, I'm hopefully going to grade it either tonight or tomorrow and we will go over either tomorrow or Wednesday. All right. Okay. That said, as you can see, <clears throat> this is where we are right now. So we're going to go over chapter 14 right now. There's going to be very little on your last test from chapter 14, just the last few pages. And I'll, I'll get to those in just a bit. Okay. Um, there is some homework, as you can see, and it's due basically in about two weeks. So it's due right before Thanksgiving. All right. And why? Because I don't want you to have to worry about this. Please don't, don't, uh, I probably have told you this before, but I'll always remember because it's Randy Kirsten who ended up becoming a very good friend of mine. But um, he, gradu you know, he graduated from, from Blackhawk where I was working, and he still is the vice president of this smaller computer company that's in Janesville, Wisconsin. And he just comes in on a month, you know, mon the Monday after Thanksgiving, slams his books down, thanks for screwing up my weekend. I said, what are you talking about? And he said, I spent all weekend working on this project. I said, you mean the one I assigned at the end of August? Yeah, well, he decided to do it that weekend because he never did it, you know, never worked on it before. It was still good, but that's not the point. The point is, what I, I don't want you to do anything, for at least for this class, over your break. All right? Okay. Also, if you don't know, today is the end of week 11. So there's 25 more days, literally, after today. All right? So we're going to go over Chapter 14. The homework will be due 11-24. Tomorrow we're going to go over Chapter 16. The homework will be due 11-24. Probably Wednesday, I'm going to guess, is when we'll go over the test. Okay? And it, it'll just work better that way. But notice Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday are all labs. All right? Then notice next week. Talk about being lab heavy. So you've got Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of this week, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Thursday of next week. That's seven lab periods. So if you say, yeah, but I've already got all the homework done, well, then you should be working on that midterm, all right, which was to redo that Belleville running site. Some of you commented on your evals that you didn't like that site. Well, sorry. Then totally rip it apart and redo it. All right, make it what you think it should be. That's totally fine. All right, put into it what you think you need to put into it. And um, also remember, you still have your electronic portfolio that's going to be due at the end of the semester. All right, so now next Friday, not this Friday, next Friday, notice I'm going to give you a pretest, and I will give you a pretest. All right, because and it's going to be very much heavy on Chapter 16 and very light on Chapter 14. All right, plus on that day, and I didn't write this down, but I'll put it in here right now, and that is go over chapter 14 and 16 written tests. And that'll be it for the written tests. In fact, 14 and 16 are it for homeworks and for labs. After Thanksgiving, notice... All right, in fact, let's see where it is. There. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, I'm going to go over the rest of the book. No homework, no labs on that stuff. All right. Now, what I'm interested in, in hearing from you when you do your evals at the end of the semester, and you were real honest, I thought, with what you wrote this time, and that's totally fine. That's what I want you to do. But if you think, well, we should have done more of this or we should have done less of this, please put that down. I'm not afraid to get slammed. I'm not. It's going to do nothing but help me. I will tell you, I've been, I've been talking to a couple of the instructors who have taught classes online here. And it sounds like when we go totally online, at least with you guys, it's going to have to be different. And what I mean is, I'm going to have to do a lot of lecturing and demoing. I mean a lot. All right? There's going to be very little time when you've got a whole day that's just a lab. I'm not saying you won't have part of a period that's, that's lab, all right? Okay, plus, 
you know, at, we're going to have to talk about what we're going to do with written tests, etc. You guys won't have written tests. To my knowledge, you guys will still be meeting. We'll be meeting in the conference room from 12.05 to 3.55, Monday through Friday. All right, that's not you guys, that's you guys. All right, so you can kind of see, and I'll send this back out again. I'll try to up, update it, upgrade it, make sure it's okay, and send that out to you so you've got it. So we've done 1 to 7. We've done 8 to 11. In this third section, we've done 12, we've done 13, and we've done 15, which again means we've got 14 and 16 left. Now, the chapter today, how to work with browser objects, cookies, and web storage. The one that we're going to care about probably the most is going to be web storage. We'll talk about what that is, what that means when we get to that point. All right, and then tomorrow we will go over chapter 16, which is on objects. All right, sometime, I gave you all those lab days, but sometime in there, I'm going to write an object-oriented JavaScript program that's going to be fairly detailed. And I'll give you a hard copy of it and we'll go over it as a class because the brunt of your last test in here will be on that. All right, and that's why, let me close that mail up. There we go, okay. All right, so with that said then, I'm gonna jump right into chapter 14 right now. My guess is this will take somewhere between now and 9 o'clock and the rest of the period today will be lab. The lecture tomorrow will take a little bit longer. It's a more complex topic. All right. All right. So as it says, this chapter shows how to use browser objects to navigate browser pages and get information about the browser. So the first thing they're going to talk about in here is the location object and the history object. It is possible that if somebody is using a program that you've created that you can gather details about them and I don't mean real I don't mean personal details but you can typically go in and check for example the type of browser that they're using the version of the browser that they're using why might you want to do that we've talked about this earlier if you could tell that somebody was going into your site and they were using IE6 which is still out there all right then you might tell them, hey, you better upgrade. All right, that kind of thing. All right, so we'll talk about that. There's the history object. And, you know, I believe you understand that. You've all used the back button, et cetera. And there's other ways that you can use that as well. We'll talk about that in a little bit of depth and breadth of coverage. Then we'll go into cookies. All right, and we'll talk about those. They'll show this task list application. What they're doing in here, just so you know, is by the end of this chapter, they want to set it up with this task list. It's like a to-do list type of thing. And they want to set it up so that if you get out of the system, so if you close your application down and you bring it up again, that data that's in there will persist. And for that data to persist, basically you've got to do it in one of a few ways. You could, we could save everything to a file, all right, and then just bring the file up every time. We could save it to a database and do that. They've chosen to do neither of those. All right, they've chosen instead to use local storage. And when you use local storage, there's two ways that you can use it. All right, and we'll talk about those towards the end of the class. All right, so that's pretty much what's in this chapter. Okay, so that says how to script browser objects. People used to come in and say, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to check when a person comes in and I'm going to check the browser they're using and I'm going to check the version that they're using and I'm going to make sure that they get the best UX or the best user experience. But when you think about it right now, between the different number of, uh, of, of browser types there are, or, you know, different number, different things like you know, again, IE and Edge and Chrome, et cetera, and all the versions, you're not going to do that. Because if you had an if statement or probably you do it with a switch statement, you would have probably hundreds of different combinations in there. And I don't know of anybody who's ever done that. Now, maybe a, maybe a place like Amazon does. I have absolutely no idea. All right. So it says this chapter starts by showing you the use of location and history objects. The location, as it says, 
lets you work with the URL for a page. It lets you control the reloading of a current page and the loading of new web pages. Why is this important? Well, if you go out and you create yourself a website, all right, one of the first or one of the things that you should be doing on a regular basis is maintenance. And you want to make sure that your website doesn't ever have broken links. All right, that's just a, a good way to get people to stop going to your site. You know, I, and it's funny because uh, one of these sites that I use, medium.com, all right, I'd say about once a week it gets where I have to like, I have to refresh my browser two or three times because it gives, keeps giving me 404 errors. And I know that's not an error. All right, so I do it, I, I go and refresh it, gives me another 404 error. I refresh it again, boom, there my article comes up. But with a lot of people, they don't do that. You know, they get a 404 error, they, well, something's broken. And again, when you think about it, if you were an e-commerce site, you may have just potentially lost revenue. All right, that kind of thing. All right, and as a, again, it says the history object lets you work with the pages stored in the browser history. Now, I want to just quickly look at this paragraph right here. Because again, this is much of what the class that you will take next fall, the AWD1111 database-driven websites class is about. So it says, with the rise of JavaScript frameworks that handle these types of processing, you're less likely to use the location and history objects in your own applications. For example, many frameworks for, for SPAs or single page applications handle that for you. We are in the middle of building SPAs now, single page applications, in the AWD1111 class. All right. And for some reason, I got a glitch in my program. I think I showed you this the other day. But this is what it looks like, all right? And you can go out here, and you can click the details, and you can get the details for any movie. Well, that let's look at it. I want this to go three across, and for whatever reason, it's not. And I still got to figure that out. I've got a glitch in my own program. So there's the, there's the title, and I can click movie details, and I can go to there. I've still got to clean up that page. But this is a SPA. This is literally a single page application. So what's happening is when it starts, it's loading this page into the system when it starts. And anytime you click here, it's loading in the other page. But it's not doing it the way that you and I do it, where you literally are making a call you know, and, and saying, okay, remove this page, move this page. It's just literally doing a replacement. May not sound like a big thing, but it is a big thing. All right. What is happening with SPA applications is you are offloading the work that the server has to do. You're making what's called more of a fat client, which means you're putting more work on the client and less work on the server. All right. So again, they come in here and they start talking about the location object, and they mention some of the properties. All right, it says to start with, this figure shows a URL that contains the six part of the parts of the URL that can be parsed. So there they are. Now, not every URL is going to have all of these parts. You know, if you go out to the home page, yes, it'll have an href, which is everything. It'll have a protocol. We've talked about this before. HTTP colon slash slash HTTPS colon slash slash or typically FTP colon slash slash for the file transfer protocol. The host name, which is your www part, all right, the port that's being used, and that stuff is really important. For example, in the AWD 1111 class, students have been able to basically, for most of the semester, pick their port which means they had to pick a number between 3,000 and 9,999. That's a pretty big range when you think about it. What is that? That's about 7,000 or whatever it is. Now we're running React, and, and that's what I just showed you on that one, and React always expects that it's running on port 3,000. That's just the way that the package is set up. All right. So. You've got the host, all right, which is, what is that? That's basically the host name plus the port number. You get the path, all right, and you may be aware of this and you may not be, but if you go, for example, if, if I go out to rankin.edu, okay, 
If I go out to rankin.edu and I don't put anything else there, by default, the system assumes that there's a page out there under, under the rankin.edu that's called index.html. It assumes that that's there, and that's what it tries to load. If it doesn't find that, then it assumes there's a, a, a thing that's called index.htm. And I may have told you about this before, I may not have, but back in the olden days, like in the 90s, all right, that back at that time, the extension that you put on the end of a file name could only be three characters. And a lot of people have kept that tradition alive, so instead of .html, they say .htm. Either one of them work. All right. If the system doesn't find a uh, index.html and it doesn't find an index.htm, then it looks for a default.html file. If it doesn't find that one, it looks for a default.htm file. All right. And after that, who knows? You may even get an error if you have none of those and you put nothing else on there unless you've come in and you've redirected to go to someplace else. All right. So here's an example with everything that's in there. And you'll notice in this, it has search parameters. So again, everything that you see up to, that's in gray there, up to right here, that's the URL. Everything with a question mark and after it is what's referred to as the query string. You get a query string when get, you use a get parameter. You don't typically see the query string when you use a post parameter. We've talked about get and post before. All right. So here's some of the things that you can use. Notice there's a reload. All right, it says reloads the current web page. And again, I think I've mentioned this to you. That for example, if I go out to CNN.com, what it's going to do is it's going to take that home page and it typically caches it, which means it's going to take a copy of it and it's going to put it someplace in my memory. All right. If I go out there a half an hour later and that page hasn't changed, it's going to bring that cached page up because it can bring it up faster. If it has changed, it'll bring up the new page. But sometimes you may want to force the new page or the page to come up, whether it's new or not. And you can do that with this. We're using the force. All right. Replace. Loads a new play page in a browser and replaces the current page in the history list. Not always, but quite often where that is used is if there's been a permanent redirect. All right. And again, I probably have shown you this already, but you know, for years when I would tell students when we would start the Java programming class, the one that you guys will be in in spring, I would say, hey, I want to show you the Java API or the Java application program interface. So I'd say go out to java.java.sun.com. And it was there for so many years that if I hit enter now, I get sent to oracle.com slash java slash technologies. It did it, it's done a permanent redirect. But so many people have bookmarked that and used that, they didn't want to get rid of it. Now, sometimes you'll see that in sites that rather than doing that, it'll come up with a blank page that says we have moved and click here to be redirected. It's much cleaner to do it this way, to be honest with you. And by and large, most people don't care. All right. All right. So the history object, as it says here, represents the browser's history of viewed pages. It says because of primary, primary privacy concerns, the amount, amount of information you can get from the history object is limited. All right. Now, look what you know. Again, not much you can do in here. People think that, yeah, you know, I go out to the Internet and um, I go and I sign up for something that now forever somebody's going to be able to, they'll know my IP address, they'll know this, they'll not typically know. All right. But the one thing you know that you've got to watch out for is, again, most of us typically click that button that says, click here to agree to our terms. Or you, know, you choose that, that checkbox option or whatever it is. And then typically what that means is they can sell your, your name and your email address to, others, to other sites. All right. That's not always what it means, but quite often it is. So notice there's not that much you can do with a history object. All right, back is like you click your back button. Forward, you know, when you've got a back button here, you've also got a forward button like that. All right. Go so you can send it forward or backwards. 
a number of pages. So with goal, if you put a negative number, you're going to go backwards. A positive number, you can go forwards. All right? And as it says, go with a substring. Go to the most recent URL in history that contains that substring. All right? And they give you some examples here. Now it says, since there is no way to determine the position of the current history in the history object, you can't find out if there are pages to go back or forward to. All right. And again, another thing, I think we've talked about this. But if you come in here, you know, I, I'm assuming you're using uh, Chrome, but if you're not, it's no biggie. It's pretty much the same. But when you start to go in here and you start to look at the stuff, I click here and the three dots that are up above here. And I go into, I think it's settings, and might be privacy and security. I don't remember. I should have looked. For, yeah, here it is. Privacy and security and clear browsing data. You should get used to doing that once in a while. It's amazing how many people have never done that. And basically, there are there's lots of stuff that's in there. All right. And you can go, when you do this, notice you can clear it for the last four weeks the last you know, 24 hours, the last seven days, and everything. I mean, I typically go in there at least once a month and I clean out my stuff. What does that mean? Well, what that means is, I'm gonna just, let's see, cancel this. That when I come into here, so if I come in and open up a new browser tab, it's got a bunch of stuff that it saved for me. It gets rid of these, all right? But it also, you know, sites that I've gone to, and, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I go out to a lot of sites to check something, and no, I don't like that. All right? And it probably has written some cookies. The, you know, the, the server probably has written some cookies, and it just is clearing that stuff out. All right? Okay. All right, so they've got this tutorial application. I don't know if it's good or bad. But the idea when you look at it is it's right here. So it comes up with a welcome to our site. You click the button that says tutorial and you're on page one. You click the next button, you go to page two. Now that you're on page two, you can either go backwards or you can go forwards. If you go forward, you can go backwards or you can say that you're done because there's no forward to go to. And they give you the code it's not, there's not real much in it, except you'll notice that they're using the location object in here, I'm on page 439, for you to be able to jump to a certain place. All right? And that's what they mention in here. I don't want to sit and read to you. Okay. All right. So the next thing are cookies. You know, a lot of people kind of laugh a little bit over that name. But the thing about cookies, are, you know, in many ways over the years, cookies have gotten a bad rap. And I mean browser cookies, okay? And what I, the reason I'm saying that is, first of all, I've heard people say, oh, get rid of cookies because they're executable files. No, they're not. A cookie is a text file. It's not an executable file, all right? And it basically, so it's typically like a .txt file. It holds some information that the browser, I'm sorry, that the server has written to your browser so when you go back to a site and revisit it again, it'll make it easier, all right, on the server side. You know, again, I've shown you this kind of thing before, that if I go out to Amazon.com, all right, that's all fine. Yeah, it remembers who I am, etc. But notice, recently reviewed. Well, while I was babysitting my daughter, my granddaughter yesterday, we spent a lot of time looking at Harry Potter junk. You know, Papa, I want that. Papa, I want that. Papa, I want that. Yeah, okay. All right. But the point is, it remembers that. So it wrote a cookie for that. Then it also has, hey, if you're going to buy that, you probably want to buy this as well. So all this stuff is linked. Why? Because they're not stupid, the people from Amazon. All right. So it says, cookies let a web server or web page store information in a user's browser and retrieve it when the user requests a new page. As it says, this concerns some users, all right, because of things that you can do all sorts of stuff that you can't do with these. Also, typically on most browsers, either there is a preset limit for the number of cookies you can have, or you can go in and set a limit. 
All right, it's not like I've got 8,000 cookies on my system here. All right. All right. It says, all these, although these rumors are not true, some developers abuse the use of cookies. For example, advertisers sometimes use cookies to track the websites that you visited. Yeah. All right. And, you know, you may have noticed this if you've ever looked at any of the videos that I put out there. All right that the chances of you being able to go through all 50 minutes without it coming up with an advertisement or whatever are pretty much nil. All right. So it says these are called third-party cookies because an ad on a web is on the website, not on the website itself. To combat this, it says web browsers let you block third-party cookies. Yeah, if you go in and do all that, you typically can. All right, so it says this topic shows you how to use cookies in a way that makes a web application work better for the user. In particular, it shows how to use cookies to save user data so that they don't have to re-enter that data. Things, you know, user preferences are a good idea for that. You know, if there's a certain font, if there's a certain color that you prefer, etc. You can set up stuff like that. And like a lot of the stuff that we talked about this semester, notice it's all set up by name value pairs. Some books will even call it a key value pair. All right. <clears throat> so we're going to see that in just a minute. And when you work with cookies, there's a lot of stuff that you can add, but there's only a few things that you have to add. All right. So it says you usually get the cookie as part of the HTTP response. All right. And then it says the browser will send the cookie back to the server with the request. So this is some of the stuff you can put in here. The lifetime of the cookie in seconds. You literally, there's other ways of doing it other than what they show right here. You can literally, I could set a cookie right now that wouldn't expire for a thousand years. You can do that. I don't think you'll be here to, uh, you know, to see whether or not it actually gets canceled then or whatever, but you can do that. And some people do that. Basically, they set something up that they know is going to be far enough into the future that they don't have to worry about it. A, an easy way to get rid of a cookie is you can set its age to something in the past. Does that make sense? You can give it a negative number or a negative or a date that's already happened, etc. So, as they say in here, <clears throat> a cookie is a small text string stored by the browser. Name value pairs must start with a name value pair that names the cookie. So you need to put in something like this at the beginning. There's the name, there's the value. The rest of the stuff that's typically in here you don't need. The more information that you give it, the more power, so to speak, the cookie will probably have. <clears throat> All right, so notice they talk about a session cookie <clears throat> and a persistent cookie. Okay? A session cookie, as it says, is deleted when the browser is closed. That's actually not exactly true. A lot of times what happens is it's set up so that it is removed 20 minutes after you close the browser. The reason that they do that is sometimes you get out, oh, I meant, I meant to not leave the browser yet. So they, the cookie might still be there. But if you forget and you look back the next day or a half an hour later, it's typically going to be gone. A persistent cookie, as it says, is saved by the browser and it remains available. So in a way, cookies provide a storage-like capability. All right? And when I say storage, like they're not, they're, they are files, all right, but they're not a database type of thing. All right. It says this type of cookie has an expiration date, which must be later than the current date. Now, notice this is what the next section is going to talk about in here. The JavaScript can create cookies, read current cookies, and delete cookies. And that's what this next section in here is about. All right. So you want to create a cookie? All right. There is a way you can create a cookie object right there. Okay? And notice that you can encode and you can decode. And the reason that encoding may be, may be important, all right, when, when I talk about cookies like this, it's not like passwords are not put in a cookie. Um, credit card numbers are not put in a cookie. But occasionally you might have something, all right, that is at least somewhat private. All right, you can do a little bit of encapsulation on that. And then when you get it out, you're not encoding it, you're decoding it, okay? Okay, 
So notice in here, here they're setting up a persistent cookie, 21, that's, I think that's days, 24 hours, 60 minutes in an hour, 60 seconds in a minute. So if instead of 21 in there, you know, you put in some god awful number like a million, and there's other ways that you can do it too. You can actually give it a physical date that's way out in the future if you want to do that. All right. So as it says here, you use the set cookie function to create either a session cookie or a persistent cookie. What's the difference again? With a session with a session cookie, you're not giving it an expiration time. All right. With a persistent cookie, you are. <clears throat> So as it says, although cookie values can't include semicolons, commas, or white space, you can use the encode URI component to basically kind of do that for you. To add multiple cookies to the cookie objects, you assign them multiple names and value pairs. Unlike other JavaScript objects, and I'm reading this because JavaScript objects is the next chapter we're going over, all right, each assignment does not overwrite the previous one. All right, so that's how you can get cookies. Uh, you can create cookies, but once you've created them, you can use the get cookie by name then to read them. All right. Now we're talking here about your own cookies, not ones that when that you're getting when you're going out to different websites, but ones that you could potentially set up on your own website. All right. <clears throat> so as mentioned here, when you assign the document cookie object to a constant or a variable its value is stored just as a big string. <clears throat> the good news about that is since it's basically stored as a big string, you can use all those string methods that we talked about, that I've shown you on W3Schools, that we've looked at on hunlock.com, etc., to do some manipulation if you need to. Such as, as it says there, the split method is often used with cookies because it provides an array, uh, provides the way, the way for you to, to go and split a single cookie, as it says, the string into an array of cookies so you can work with each different component that's there. All right. And since you can create them, since you can read them, you can also delete them. All right. So there, they show a bunch of different ways that you can do in here. You can literally just set it equal to nothing. All right. And there's other ways that you can do it as well. It used to be the way that you do it was you basically would set it to the current date or current day, basically, current date minus one. All right, which means, that, again, that, it, that, that basically it expired yesterday type of an idea. Now, this is not real complete. I mean, if you think that this is something that you're going to need and you're going to use, I would definitely recommend, again, taking a trip, even more so than W3 schools. All right, I would go out to the, the uh, Mozilla developer network and take a look out there because they got a lot of really good stuff out there on cookies. All right, so again, they build this task list, and there it is. They, they refine and they refine and they refine this task list. Now, a couple things about it that are good. All right, it's going to start to be persistible, if that's a word. So you can you know, get out and get back in again, and your, your tasks will still be there. That's good. You can add new tasks. That's good. So what's bad? Well, one thing that's bad is you cannot currently, at least, you cannot edit existing tasks. So if you made a mistake on one of these, if, if this meet with Mike, you know, I put meet with like and I wanted to change it, I'd have to drop it and recreate it. That's kind of a pain. All right. Plus, notice there's a clear tasks, but there's no way right now to clear an individual task. So it's an all or nothing proposition, which isn't really the best way to do something like that. All right. So again, they give you the code. Other than the fact they've used IDs for a bunch of stuff, there's nothing in there that you haven't seen, and that's just a that's a text area right here. All right. So with a JavaScript, what's new? They're working with cookies. All right. All right. So with that said, let's just jump into this. Is already the last part of the chapter. Now I'm going to do this a little bit differently. And that is, I am going to go and type in W3 schools, and we'll put in here web storage. All right. 
and there it is. So I want to start just quickly by looking at this. It says web storage better than cookies. All right, with web storage, web applications can store data directly within the user's browser. It's as though you've got a mini database on your browser that you can use to hold things. All right, for how long? As long as you want. How much? You're not going to be able to put gigabytes of information out there, but usually it's a few meg. I think it's five meg or something like that. All right. So it says before HTML5, application data had to be stored in cookies. All right. It says web storage is more secure and large amounts of data can be stored locally. Why is that a big thing? Because unless they've changed it, the maximum size you could make a cookie was 4K. That's 4,000 bytes. That's quite a difference from 5 meg. All right. Now, when you use these, notice again, talked about this a little before there's two different types there again is session storage so the stuff that you store in session storage is designed to be removed once you remove the session which means once you shut the browser down local storage on the other hand stores data with no expiration date all right so if you want to keep it around so again if I had a cart a shopping cart in an app that I was creating I would probably end up using local storage Somebody could put something into a cart, maybe leave, maybe even shut down their browser, but maybe come back a day, a week, a month, a year later, and still that stuff would be in there. So if they wanted to buy it still, they'd be able to. All right. It says, before using web storage, check browser support. And, and really, again, you've seen this kind of thing before. So if I go in, out to caniuse.com, all right, and I put in here local storage, and hit enter. Again, it's the usual players in here that are red. All right, and what I mean is it's older versions of browsers. So if people are using, you know, a more up-to-date version, look at it, for IE, it's six and seven. You can actually go out and find stats. And I believe now it's down to like, I think it's less than 1% of the population that are using that browser that are using those versions. All right. All right, so when you use this, and I'm bringing this up because you guys will hear about it in spring, you guys will start hearing about it also in spring. I mean, it pretty much means the same thing. We start talking about getters and setters. You've looked at these a little bit already with some of the DOM stuff we've done. When you use a getter, Typically, what you're doing is you're grabbing information that exists and you're copying it over to a variable. When you use a setter, you're typically grabbing something and giving it a value. All right? So as it says right here, what are we doing in here? Well, we're setting in here, we're setting a value in the local storage. The name of that value that we're setting is going, so the key or whatever you want to call it is last name. The actual value itself that we're going to store for last name is Smith. All right. And as they say in here, example explained, create a local storage name value pair with name of last, last name and value of Smith. Then once you've got that, all right, so you do a, a basically you come in here and you do a get item. All right. And then you can come in here and they'll show it a little later. You can do a set item. All right. So name value pairs are always stored as strings. All right. And this is the local storage, and they also show you how to do it in there with session storage. All right. If you have, and I haven't written the test yet, your last test, but if on that last test there's going to be anything from this chapter, it'll be something fairly minor on local storage just so you get a, a flavor of it, so to speak. And you'll see it on your homeworks, too. All right. So again, in the olden days, cookies were the only option. Again, as it says, they were past every request. They can only store about 4,000 bytes. Modern browsers now offer web storage. All right. And as it says, it can store more data. So you went from 4,000 to 5 million. All right. And again, we already looked at the difference between local storage and session storage, so I'm not going to say those again. Here's a couple things 
where they've gone in here and they've actually used the set item. So you can tell in both cases what the name of the item is and what the value that's going to be stored there is. All right. And again, that's what they talk about in here. Like it or not like it, one thing about these books is they give you tons of examples. All right, and I know some of you put down on your, on your eval you didn't like the book. Okay, I understand that. I will tell you it's, it's, it's interesting because this version of the book that you have is much better than the previous version. They cleaned up a lot of stuff, and, and it's better than it was. All right, now the version that you guys have for HTML is, has been rewritten, and now there's a new one that's coming out for fall. And I will tell you, because I'm the one who suggested these books, all right? And Mr. Smith doesn't like them. Mr. Gudmanstead has told me, unless he's changed his mind, he, man, we're using this, we're going to use these books again next year. I, I, like, I like the Miroc books. I like the way they explain stuff, etc. Not everybody agrees with that. See, Mr. Smith is the kind of guy who, who in at least some of his classes, doesn't even have books. He'll just give you PDFs that are online, etc. Some people like that, some people don't. All right. So, pretty much when you look in here, we've gone over everything that's right here. All right. Again, I don't want to read it to you. I just want you to see it. All right. So, finally, they go back and they use web storage with the task list. Doesn't look any different than it did previously when they use cookies. All right, but you'll notice when you come into the JavaScript, now they're referring to local storage. Okay. And they did the set item as we, we showed, but we didn't really go over these. There's the remove item. All right. All right. Finally, the chapter ends with, starting on 456 here, how to use Chrome with cookies and web storage. All right, it says that's why this chapter finishes by showing the application panel of the Chrome browser to do that. So again, if I were to come in here, and I'll just grab this one. This is that one I told you that I was working on for the other class. If I right mouse click in here, and I go down to inspect, and over here I click this double arrow, and I find application, all right, what it will show me in here, let me move this, there we go, is if I come to here, it'll show me any cookies that have been set will be set right here. Does that make sense? All right. And if I don't want them anymore, I can right mouse click on here, notice there's a clear. Typically, you can either do that or you can click on, that'll clear all of them. If you want to clear an individual cookie, you would highlight it here, right mouse click on it, and tell it to clear. All right. Some of the work that we do in the AWD 1111 class, we work a little bit with cookies in there. Again, why I'm mentioning that to you. All right. So this is what it looks like <clears throat> when there actually are cookies in there. So they're using that task list. So they've got a cookie named task. All right. And there is its value, etc. <clears throat> So pretty much what they just showed you in here, it's what I just mentioned to you. We didn't have any cookies in there, so I just wanted to show you what you do. All right, and that's it. All right, so that's it for today. Again, tomorrow, all right, not Chapter 15. We already have gone over that one. So I'm going to put in here 504. It must be about right. Nope. All right, so 503. This is where we'll pick it up tomorrow. And it says, so far in this book, you've been using native JavaScript, JavaScript objects like the number object, the string, the date, the array, etc. But one thing we have never really done is to create our own objects. All right, and we're going to start simple. All right, they will go through this example, and they will go back and rebuild the miles per gallon program, and they will start using objects. The reason I'm taking just a second to explain this to you, not to waste your time, but to let you know that JavaScript is very unique in that there's two ways that you can work with objects in here. The old way that you still see 
is called prototyping objects. We will talk about that. The new way of doing it is very similar in nature, not identical, but very similar in nature to the way languages like Java and C Sharp do it. All right, these guys did some work last, last spring and near the end of the semester, we did some work with classes in object-oriented programming. Now we're doing it in here too, all right? Okay, so like I said, we'll pick it up tomorrow right there on that page. And what that'll mean is after tomorrow, we will have gone through all of the first 16 chapters in the book. And again, the week after Thanksgiving, Monday I'm going to go over this, no homework, no tests. Tuesday I'm going to go over this, no homework, no tests. And Wednesday I'm going to go over this. This is a preview of one of the two major components for the AWD 1111 class that you will take in fall. All right? That's all I got.